You know, people will visit Seattle during the summer from California and other parts of the United States, and they'll fall in love with our pristine lakes, uh, the waters of Puget, Puget Sound, Orcas Island, the San Juans, uh, the rainforest, the snow-capped Cascades, Mount Baker, Mount Pilchuck, Mount Rainier. They'll look at this magnificent scenery that we have here, uh, and they'll enjoy the ambience that we all um, enjoy because of the things that we have. And sometimes they'll get the idea, well, boy, this would be a great place to live. And they'll decide to move here. Like that song that was popular in the late 60s, though, the bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle. Oh, yeah? The uh, people that have been around for a while know that that may be true in July, August, and September, notably, but they're not always that blue. And of course, that's one of the reasons why the Pacific Northwest is so beautiful and so green is because of the fact, and if they'd done any research, they would have Noted statistically, Seattle has 155 days of rain a year on average. Of course, that's give and take a few on either side of that. Plus, for another 80 days of the year, the skies are either cloudy or they're overcast or they're gray. And when you add all of these things together, and of course, I didn't plan it, but today's probably a pretty fair illustration of the type of weather that we have here. Now this can be gloomy, it can be depressive. You've all probably heard the word seasonal affective disorder, or SAD for short, S-A-D. And that's something that is quite common in the Pacific Northwest because of the weather, the effect of the weather. It has that kind of effect on us. Mr. Luker, a number of years ago, was speaking to the men who had speaking assignments, and he was making general observation about the congregation. And he also mentioned that, you know, because of the fact we have the type of weather that produces this type of um, disorder, and because of the fact it has those effects on us and on the congregation, he said, you ought to gear your services, I mean, your um, sermonettes or split sermons or sermons and whatever you're doing, when you speak, you ought to give two things, hope and you need to give encouragement. Hope and encouragement. And for men who are just starting to speak, I would say that's probably a pretty good thing to remember because if you include either one of those components in your message, then you will have done a valuable service to the congregation, to the people who are listening to you. And of course, not all sermons or sermonettes or whatever uh, it, you can do that with you. It's not, not a carte blanche because there's some things that are doctrinal and you know other things that you might have to um, use in a different manner. But for the most part, hope and encouragement and like I said, I've always been um, indebted to him for that advice. Well, SAD, or SAD, is a type of depression that may occur uh, at any time of the year, but it usually, for the most part, occurs at the same time every year. 
usually in the fall when the weather begins to change and on throughout the winter. It can be very debilitating. You know, it can sap your energy and causes you to feel down, uh, gloomy, moody, or depressed. When you read about it, typically the way it's treated is with psychotherapy or medication. And there's another uh, method of treating it as well, and it's called light therapy. Now, I'm somewhat familiar with this because when my wife, Veronica, was going through menopause, her hormones were topsy-turvy, and she became very, very depressed. And in discussing this with the doctor she was going to at the time, he suggested using light therapy. So she bought one of these lights, or a special kind, uh, it's about this wide and about this high, and it, it's, um, the lights are in this figure, the configuration at kind of a slant, and I'm not exactly sure why. I never did look at the technicalities of it. But it mimics natural outdoor life. That's what it's designed to do. And it really worked. She usually had it in the kitchen, which is where we tended to spend a lot of our time. And I would walk in the room, and after being there for a while, without being conscious of it, I even was affected. It made me feel better. It really worked. That exposure to uh, natural light that on days like this, we just don't have. We don't have them the same way. Now, I'm not here to sell those lights, <laughs> lest you think I am. I'm just saying I can attest to their effectiveness because I saw how Veronica was helped and experienced the collateral benefits to me as well. I think probably you all at one time or the other have heard the song Camelot which describes the ideal place where the weather patterns are always the same. Everything is predictable. Um, you know, it's neither hot, too hot, and it's not too cold. Uh, it rains at night, very convenient. You don't, you're not, you don't have to worry about umbrellas or anything like that because the rain falls when no one's out in it and you wake up the next morning and you have a bright sunny day. Uh, and when you think about the lyrics, if you ever look at them, you'll, you'll see that it reminds you of the Garden of Eden, what it was like. And you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 2-6, verse, verse 6 of Genesis 2, it said, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And that was how it was done in the Garden of Eden. Now, I don't understand if you were asking me to explain just exactly how that worked. You know, were there cisterns? Were there pools? Were there artesian wells where that water came from? Uh, I don't know what God's sprinkler system was at that time, but that's how it happened. And that you know, will be the way it'll be in the millennium. It's not going to be that way now. Uh, I heard, I think, driving in today, we're supposed to have, I don't know, three quarters of an inch and maybe another inch tonight of rain. So it's not happening here right now, but in the millennium, we will have ideal weather conditions. Well, no, mo no one is immune from sadness, no one's immune from depression. We're all subject to it at different times in our lives because of different things that happened. It affects people who are young, like David. Um, he suffered. I'm just going to uh, go to 1 Samuel 30, 1 Samuel 30, and read the first three verses that give a little bit of the background in his particular case and why he suffered. 
1 Samuel 30, verse 1. Uh, it came to pass when David and his men were coming to Ziglag, and Ziglag was where they lived. Uh, on the third day, it took them three days to get there, they'd been out fighting, that the Amalekites had invaded the south of it. And that's when they discovered that while they were gone, the Amalekites had come in, smitten it, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were there. They didn't kill any, but carried them away. In verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They were so distraught and so discouraged and so sobered by what they found. And you can imagine what it would be like to return to your home nothing but ashes burned to the ground and you look around for your children and your wife and they're nowhere and I suppose maybe a first thought they may have thought maybe they were all in the ashes maybe they'd burned them all but then for some reason they realized that that wasn't the case that the Amalekites had taken them anyway they had no power to weep they were simply Exhaust, and if you've ever experienced an emotional time in your life where that happens, you can perhaps understand it. A number of you may remember um, a lady named Gloria Bosserman who attended church in Seattle a number of years ago. Her oldest daughter had a son who just graduated from high school. Uh, in Marysville and I don't know if this happened graduation night or if it happened within a few days but it was very very close to the time of graduation who was involved in a fatal automobile accident and was killed and I remember when I went to the funeral I was struck by how many teenagers were in the audience he apparently was well-known, well-liked, a popular young man. And when his mother walked up to the front of the congregation uh, to sit where the family was seated, she turned around and looked at a lot of these kids because she knew a lot of them and gave them the thumbs up and had kind of a weak smile. And I was impressed with that, that she had that kind of composure under the circumstances, but I think she probably was still probably in a state of shock. But in any event, as the service progressed, and I don't remember exactly what was said, but all of a sudden, one of these young teenage girls started sobbing. And her body was just racked with pain the way the way she sounded. It was, I guess, what it would have been like at the wailing wall. And that went on for maybe 15 or 20 seconds, and then another one the same way. And maybe there were several more, but I just remember those first two. And I thought, you know, that's the kind of approach that you find in the world when maybe you have no hope of the future. There's nothing out there that, um, you know, at that time helps explain what's happening. You'll never see that person again. And there was a sense of utter hopelessness and despair and futility in those sobs. They, they were almost like shrieks. I've never heard anyone do that at a funeral, you know, since that time. But like I say, these were mostly teenagers, and, uh, and I can understand. But anyway, this was what David and his men were going through, and they had no more power to weep because they thought they'd lost all of their families. Verse 5, and David's two wives... Ahinoam and Abigail were taken captive. So 
somehow they were able to figure out that you know they no one was burned that a number of them were taken captive verse 6 and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him now it's not enough to come and find your home destroyed leveled by fire and nothing there but ashes but then you hear everyone starting to talk about killing you because they blamed him presumably for saying well if you and your men hadn't been gone out there fighting wherever they were fighting uh, there would have been someone here to protect us to protect our property to pro protect our wives and children and so they were speaking about stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters but what did he do what did David do it says in the latter part of verse 6 but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God he didn't lose focus he sobbed along with everyone else I'm sure and if you go to verse 19 there was a happy ending because they were able to David consulted with God and asked what he should do and God said yes go ahead pursue after them and they not only caught up with the Amalekites and recovered their wives and their children and all of the property that had been taken but I think that there was even more from some of the other conquests the Amalekites had made so there was a happy ending to this but there certainly was a time of sorrow and a, certainly a time of depression and despair no one is immune from depression or SAD the young can be affected like David was at that time or an older person can be affected as well and we're next going to look at the example of Job and how he was affected turn to Job 1 verse 20 and while you're going there I'll just rehearse a little bit of the story and most of you know it well so I probably wouldn't have to do it but there may be some that aren't um, you know conversant with it anyway Satan appeared before God and God asked him you know where have you been what have you been doing he said I've been walking up and down the earth and he said have you observed my servant Job how uh, righteous that man is how upright he is uh, but you know a man after my own heart and so Satan said well yeah look at all of the material things that you've given him he has all of these sheep and all of these oxen and all of these camels uh, he's got ten children you've blessed him so much but I'll tell you what you take away some of these things and then see what his reaction is God said all right he's in your hands the only thing I I'm going to ask you is that I don't want him touched I don't want him killed anything like that so right off the bat there are a number of things that happened all at the same time virtually one after the other 500 yoke of oxen or a thousand altogether uh, and 500 donkeys were taken by the Sabaeans and all of the servants and all of the farm hands and everyone associated with taking care of these cattle were killed with the exception of one who escaped and was able to get back and tell Job what had happened then the next 
thing that happened was a supernatural fire burned 7,000 sheep and all of the shepherds. And one escaped to get back and tell Job what had happened. And then the Chaldeans got 3,000 camels and killed all of the servants who were guarding them. And you have to remember there were a large number of people involved in taking care of Job's house and his seven sons' homes and all of the livestock that he owned. So it wasn't a small number of people that were involved here. It said he had a great household. And then, of course, the coup de grace came when a great wind destroyed his eldest son's house where all of his brothers and sisters were having a feast. And they all died, all the servants, all of the cooks, everyone that was serving them, and only one escaped. So out of all of the people that were part of his household, only four survived, and those were the four messengers that came to tell him the good, quote, or unquote, the bad news. Um, verse 20 of Job 1, the first chapter of Job, verse 20 and 21. Then Job arose and rent his coat, or mantle, and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and cursed God and said, no, he didn't do that. He worshiped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshiped. How many of us if we had bad news about something like that. I mean, that was catastrophic to have all of those things happen to you and your family in one day. Maybe if Mount Rainier blew, we'd have similar circumstances where entire families, entire villages and towns, not to say they're called villages, but there's some that are pretty small that are, could be considered that, but all destroyed at the same time. The landslide up in, you know, near, near Darrington was probably an example of something like that being able to happen. Verse 22, in all this God sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He told them, or I mean he said, um, it, it's in God's hands, and that's the way it is. Our lives are in God's hands. Let's go on with the story for a few more verses. Job 2, beginning in verse 6, and, and here again, this is a, just a rehearsal of the rest of the story as it, it unfolded. Um, Satan came before God again shortly after this and said, yeah, and, and God pointed out, look at everything I let you do to him, and yet he's still upright. So Satan said, okay, what if you inflict him personally? Because that will make a difference. So God said, okay, I'll continue playing your game. I'll allow you to harm him, except I don't want you to take his life. So verse 6 of Job 2, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he's in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan left and smote Job with sore boils from head to toe. And if you've ever had one, you know how painful they can be. But he didn't have one, he had them covering his body, and it's little wonder in verse 8 that he took a potsherd and scraped himself and sat down among the ashes because there probably wasn't any place else 
where he could be comfortable. And they were probably draining, uh, and, and he was feeling so miserable. Maybe there was something therapeutic about being in ashes. I don't know. Anyway, in verse 9, Then said his wife unto him, Do you still retain your integrity? Are you really that good? You know, what have you been doing behind my back? You've got to have done something, otherwise God wouldn't have dealt with you this way. What sin are you hiding? So, based on where you're sitting now in a pile of ashes, why don't you just curse God and die? I think sometimes when we read that, and because this chapter, I mean, this book is focused pretty exclusively on Job, we maybe don't look at what she said and think about the way all of this affected her as well. You know, when she became pregnant with the first one, she was the one that suffered morning sickness. She was the one that was throwing up and looking for crackers to eat. She was the one that, as her pregnancy progressed, was eating pickles and peanut butter, if they had peanut butter back there, or, or some, um, you know, obnoxious <laughs> type of uh, thing put together. But it was her that was having this happen to. And, of course, then the final event the childbirth itself and the pain associated with that. Now, they may have had so many servants and nannies and au pairs or whatever to take care of these children after they were born. Maybe she wasn't a hands-on mother after that. But after you've gone through the process of giving birth to a child ten times, no wonder she was attacking him as she was. I mean, because she had a pretty vested interest in those children. And this wasn't just kind of, you know, something you shrug off. You try to explain to a woman who has lost one child the answer that she's always asking and always looking for at that time. And the question is, why? Why has this happened? And she was probably saying, why has this happened with all 10 of my children at the same time? And so you can understand coming from that background and that knowledge and the knowledge of how a woman and a mother would feel, you can understand striking out as she did. But Job said in verse 10, he said unto her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we, re shall we not receive or <laughs> Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Do we have a silver spoon in our mouth? You know, if we're blessed by God, do we take that for granted, and do we think that's something we're entitled to? He said, no. You know, you take the good and you take the bad. That's the reality of living. That's the reality of life. Just because you're in the church doesn't mean that you're going to sail through life without anything happening to you. And it said in the latter part of verse 10, In all this did not Job sin with his lips, And in verse 13, his three friends came to console him. 
and they were amazed when they saw what they saw. So they sat down with him up on the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spoke a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. They just sat there with him. And that's something to remember. When you're dealing with someone who has had a great loss, and is down and depressed and is sad and is suffering because of that loss, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Maybe put your arm around their shoulder or give them a hug, but sometimes you don't have to say anything. Your presence, just being there, will be enough until such time as they want to talk. Well, there was a happy ending to all of this, as I'm sure you know, and I'm not going to read about it, but in Job 42, uh, chapter 42, he ended up with twice as many animals as he had before and ten more children. So although you never forget a child that's been lost, at least there were new children to help replace that anguish and that sorrow. No one is immune from depression or SAD. It affected a young person like David. It affected an old person like Job. It affected a poor, poor person like Naomi. And we're going to look at a few verses that look at her life. Now, the word Naomi means my delight or my pleasantness. I want you to remember <coughs> that because we're going to see uh, something about that a little later. In Ruth 1, verse 1, book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So the prospects for any kind of a future where they were were very, very dismal. And they heard that in Moab at least they could earn a living. So they pulled up stakes, left, and went to Moab. Verse 2, Elimelech was the husband, Naomi was his wife, and Malon and Chilion were the two boys. And they came into Moab and continued there, and verse 4 indicates that they were there for 10 years, a decade. During that time, it was a pretty eventful decade for them. Uh, Lemelech died, both of his sons got married, and then, in short order, they died as well. So a lot happened in that 10-year period of time. And in verse 6, Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem because it was now prosperous. It had gone through a famine. It survived. Uh, things were looking good there. So in verse 12, she was giving her daughter-in-law daughter-in-laws, two of them, advice. She said, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also, if I got married tonight, had a husband, became pregnant, had another son, and then another son, if I had two more sons, you'd have to wait another 20 years at least. And that doesn't make sense at all. So she said, you know, you need to stay here. And one of the girls thought about it and decided her mother-in-law was right. So she left. But Ruth went with her in verse 19. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said... Is this Naomi? Verse 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, 
which as I said before means my delight or my pleasantness. Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. And that's what Mara means. It means bitterness. And when you think about what she left Bethlehem with and what she returned with, she lost her husband, she lost two of her sons, she lost a daughter-in-law. The daughter-in-law was still alive, but was no longer with her. Verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? as attested to because of all of her losses. Ruth 2 and verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth went out to glean fields so she and her mother could eat and just happened to um, wander onto his field. And when he saw her out there, he asked his men who she was, and they told her. And uh, he was impressed with what she had done, come back into a strange land to take care of her mother-in-law. So he said, don't harass her, don't bother her, let her glean there. As a matter of fact, you can drop extra food for her. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all the story. You know it pretty well. They eventually became man and wife. And in chapter 4, verse 17, Ruth had her first child. Ruth 4, verse 17. And the women, her neighbors, gave it, the baby, a name, saying, There's a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. So because of the series of events that happened that surrounded all of these things, David was the end result. So this, this story had a happy ending. No one's immune from depression or sad. It can strike men and women young like David, old like Job, poor like Naomi, and another category is the rich. And I'm going to talk about King Solomon, the last example. Turn to Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2, where he's saying, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, if you're trying to get a bestseller, self-help book on the New, York's New York Times list for bestsellers, this is totally the wrong approach. If it's very, very negative, you don't worry, don't try to do anything, <laughs> nothing's going to turn out right, everything's vain, everything's bad. Uh, that's how the book started off. Verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man can't utter it. The eye's not satisfied with seeing. It doesn't make any difference how many beautiful landscapes you see. You're never satisfied. You want to see another one. Nor the ear filled with hearing. You see a, hear a beautiful um, piece of music, and you want to hear it again. I can only think of one time that I heard one that I never ever wanted to hear again. And that was when I was going through a fraternity initiation my sophomore year in college. On a Friday night, we, all the pledges that were going through the initiation had to appear, had to be there at six o'clock. And at that time, we were given a gunny sack to wear. That was all we had on. And we had this big onion with a string through it tied around our neck, and that was called our apple. And any time any of the active members asked us and requested us to do, each take a bite out of your apple, we had to sink our teeth into that onion. 
Well, you can imagine what that's like after 42 hours when that's all you've had to eat. Uh, terrible thing, but that's not what I'm going to just tell you about. Right at 6 p.m., a 45 record was put on the uh, phonograph. Chuck Berry singing a song called Roll Over Beethoven. And any of you that live back in the 50s or 60s probably will remember that song. I used to like it. But after 42 hours, I figured out, I calculated, I'd listened to it 1,125 times. I couldn't ever listen to that music for years after it. I, eventually, I got so, I, if I heard it, you know, it always brought back those memories. So, you know, the ear can be filled, I guess, in that particular case. Verse 18. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So the more information you get, and we're in a technology age, an age of rapid information, that's just the way it is. But does that bring happiness? Solomon said, in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increases sorrow. In the very last chapter of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, this was the next to the last verse, he summarized everything that he had mentioned before. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is what it's all about. However, he didn't follow his own advice because in 1 Kings 11, verse 4, you don't have to turn there. Um, we're told when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. So, in a way, he predicted what was going to happen to him because he said, with knowledge comes sorrow and grief. Increased knowledge increases sorrow. Well, this is a very cynical commentary for the Donald Trump of his day, the man who had everything but ended up with really nothing. And of course, who are we to judge? We don't really know how God viewed his life and everything. And I'm glad that uh, you know we have a merciful father. Will he be around or because he turned his back on God, is that it for him? Sometime when you get a chance, Google lottery winners on the internet. Um, I looked at a article that that brought up and one was 19 lottery winners who blew it all. But that was just one example. Um, and I, and I'm not citing that as a reference. I'm just telling you that it was interesting that to hear the lives of these 19 people and what finally ended up. A lot of them were bankrupt, suicide, early deaths, estrangement within their family, um, and that, that type of thing. And you would think here, a very, very rich with all kinds of opportunity from something like that, that they should be happy. But as I say, Google it and do a research on that sometime. You'll be surprised. And if, you've ever, if you ever buy lottery tickets, forget it. That's almost a deterrent to doing it. So the young, the old, the poor, the rich, men and women, no one is immune to the effects of sadness and depression. Sometimes we put on a good front and we try to hide it if we're feeling that way because after all, we want to appear that you know we've got it all together. I'm okay, you're okay type of thing. Um, you know, 
we're in God's church and everything should just be great when sometimes you're desperately, desperately waiting and want, wanting to talk to someone about what's going on in your life or desire even to have a meaningful conversation with God, but you don't feel close enough to him to feel that will help. Well, we shouldn't ignore sadness or depression since it can become a serious medical problem you know, that requires immediate attention. Don't forget to check out the value of light therapy. I, you know, I saw it myself, so I know that it can be helpful, especially on a day like today when it's gloomy and oppressive outside. Having that extra light can be very, very beneficial. When I was at the feast in Bend this year, a young lady and her mother were talking to me about um, something that they were experiencing. Uh, they, the girl and her husband had been married for, I don't know, three or four, four or five years, and they were trying to have a family. Uh, she hadn't been able to get pregnant, and they'd done a variety of things. And I don't know, somewhere in a conversation I talked about being anointed, and she said, you mean you can be anointed for that? Can be anointed to get pregnant? Well, we need to remember we can be anointed for sadness and depression as well. It's not you know, like a broken arm or something like that, but it's a emotional, it's a mental problem, and God can heal us of that. So there will be 155 days of rain in Seattle this year, give or take a few. There will be another 80 days that are cloudy and gray and overcast, and all of these things coupled together can be a catalyst to bring on sadness and or depression. Be aware of the effects that this weather may have on you, but don't allow it to be a decisive factor in the way you conduct your lives. We need to look at the big picture and understand what our most important focus should be. Pay very close attention to King Solomon's admonition in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, where he said, let us hear the conclusion or the summary of the whole matter. Tell us what we need to know to have happy, fulfilled, and depression-free lives. Fear God and keep his commandments, because when everything is said and done, this is and should be the end result, because this is the whole duty of man.